Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and we're back with another episode of Ask GN where we answer your questions. So if you have questions for next episode, post them below. We'll get to a couple of them and see what we can learn. For this week, we're going to start off with some CPU stuff and this question is from Zudish, I think. <laughs> Zudish asks, I was always wondering, is hyperthreading software and does that mean every CPU should have it? As it stands now, I don't like hyperthreading. It's an elite CPU thing, and that's why it's not supported because it's a niche thing. How can we get more CPU uh, CPU cores to organize threads better and be ubiquitous across all CPU brands? So first of all, a couple things here. Uh, hyperthreading is part of something called simultaneous multi-threading or SMT. The word hyperthreading is specifically Intel's implementation of SMT, and AMD can do it as well. They just don't call it hyperthreading. With that stated, does every CPU have it? Should it all? Should every CPU have it? Not necessarily. Hyperthreading is not software, as was sort of asked here. It is on the hardware level. It's sort of a switch that, in Intel's case, they can throw the switch. But there's additional validation that needs to be performed, so that does add to cost. And in terms of being a so-called elite CPU thing. I guess that depends on your perspective, but there's definitely uses for hyperthreading and places where you wouldn't want to use it. And in some gaming scenarios, there's really no gain at all. And actually we've seen maybe one FPS advantage in non-hyperthreaded equivalent CPUs if they're clocked the same. And then in other cases like video production, you see actually pretty big gains from having extra threads. So it depends less on the CPU. This is answering the last part of the question saying, how do we get CPU cores to organize the threads better? That's not really where the problem is. The problem is on the software organizing the threads and assigning threads or tasks to different threads. So with hyperthreading, say you have four core CPU with eight threads, Windows just sees eight threads. It doesn't really care how many cores there are. All it knows is that there's eight threads and maybe CryEngine says, let's use six of those for game logic, game AI, game rendering, physics, and two other, a couple other things. If that happens, it'll just task out those items to the threads as appropriate as they're defined within the software, the game engine, Windows, etc. And that's not really on the CPU side. The CPU doesn't go seeking for things to assign itself. It needs to be told what to do at some level by the host, even though the CPU does control everything ultimately at the end of the day. So that hopefully answers part of that question. As for uh, hyperthreading not being supported because of the niche thing, that same thing there, Hyperthreading isn't really something that uh, is explicitly supported or not supported. It's just the usage of threads and how many threads can be utilized or spawned by the game engines and the software, not really so much on the hardware side, more entirely on the software side. So that stated, a couple things to, to sort of wrap this question. Hyperthreading is part of SMT or simultaneous multi-threading. AMD does this thing where they, their modules for their older architectures and some of their current architectures, they'll run sort of a, a one module with maybe one FP or floating point processing unit and then a couple of integer units or ALUs. And that's sort of their version of SMT, depending on Intel and AMD's definitions of threads or cores. They define them a little bit differently between their architectures. So that's important to note as well. It's not really a linear comparison core to core for these two different architectures between Intel and AMD because they define them differently right now. Next question is from Andika who asks, right now both AMD and Intel are integrating better and better graphics hardware on their CPUs. Definitely true. Do you think this trend will continue in the future? How far are we from VR capable iGPUs or integrated graphics processors? So. Starting with the VR question, I'm not really sure how far away we are. It depends on how VR evolves and what you define as VR capable, because of course there can be lower requirement VR applications that aren't as high render quality, but uh, I was, we're definitely a little ways off. Right now they're not, IGPs aren't that powerful right now. It'll be a little while. They might be able to run some VR applications or VR desktops, but uh, running sort of VR games, uh, we're, we're a bit away from that. Now, in terms of integrating better graphics hardware, this is pretty interesting and maybe not where the question was intended to go. But yes, the trend will continue. And the interesting part of that is because GPUs are almost sort of replacing CPUs in a lot of ways. CPU will stick around. 
but the importance of the GPU has grown tremendously over the last few years. And a lot of that is the APIs that are being used and the ability to sort of push processes or tasks to the GPU rather than the CPU, the GPU being parallel. So it can handle things better when there's a lot going on at once. And as AMD is a good example here, as these different processing architectures grow and Intel and AMD build to enable their IGPs to handle some of the basic processing tasks within any host environment, the importance of GPUs will continue to grow. CPUs will continue to assign more die space to their GPUs. And that's, I think we're, we're gonna see a lot of the advancement in the immediate future for CPU architectures. Next question is from Renardo, who says, what are your thoughts on Linux gaming? So I, I think we addressed this in one of the first Ask GN episodes. The thing with Linux gaming is it is very interesting. And I was really hoping that Steam's OS would sort of build this Linux gaming community. And it has, it's definitely built up an ecosystem where now developers have some level of support from a major publisher, Valve, where they can get either financial or programming support to support Linux. So that's definitely grown and that's a good thing, but SteamOS did sort of fall off a cliff. It's not really as visible as it was intending to be, I think. Steam machines, a lot of hype for them. They've kind of disappeared now. So I'm not really sure what they're doing with that or what their plans are for the immediate future, but it does seem like it's kind of hibernated. In terms of Linux gaming in general, of course you don't need SteamOS to do Linux gaming. It's, it's very important, I think, especially as Windows sort of uh, has historically alienated some of its user base with different moves that Microsoft's making. But you've got all these driver issues, you have software support issues. So it's, it's not really gonna take off until more people start adopting Linux and developers can internally justify their expense to build on their development cost and port or support Linux. And of course the drivers are also an issue. So my thoughts on it, purely from sort of an industry standpoint, Linux is incredibly important. We build our servers on it. It's important for competition in the market. It's important for offering a free solution if you don't need Windows or don't want it, but it's not entirely there yet for gaming. Of course, to get it there though, it needs users. So sort of a catch 22 in that regard. Last question is from Ron Mose, who is asking about DX12. Again, we have more DX12 content every week. And Ron says, what are your thoughts about DX12 and NVIDIA? They seem to do bad lately in DX12 tests due to their proprietary middleware GameWorks, I believe. <laughs> so uh, first of all, GameWorks is not the reason that they have some poor performance in DX12 benchmarks. That's, that's sort of just completely unrelated. Uh, the reason that the performance is the way it looks is because the architecture is on a hardware level. So NVIDIA doesn't do the sort of same processing architecture that AMD does, where AMD has asynchronous compute engines, and those are used to asynchronously queue up tasks. We've talked about this a lot in the past videos, so I'll leave those uh, for more discussion on that. But asynchronously queues tasks, which was built sort of for Mantle, and Mantle is really very similar to DX12 at a top level. So AMD is good at that type of processing where things can get queued up without building and waiting on other tasks in the pipe. NVIDIA doesn't do it the same way. And that's something we'll talk about more as Pascal begins to continue leaking slowly information. We'll start talking about GPU architectures and how the, the build or the pipeline for GPUs and the rendering pipeline impacts performance in DX12 and other APIs but it's, it's really not to do with GameWorks. It's just to do with the hardware architecture. So that is all for this week. As always, comments below. If you have more questions, hit the link to the Patreon, uh, link to Patreon in the post video if you want to help us out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.